Welcome to episode 144 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live September 20th, 2019. This is a show about Office 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss a topic or recent news and how it relates to you. In this episode, we attempt to start answering a couple listener questions as we start a journey into the mire of information protection and the slew of acronyms that go along with it. Let's get started. As long as your doorbell doesn't ring. Well, it is iPhone day. It is. iPhone delivery day. The day that all UPS and FedEx drivers, I don't know if they hate it or not. They essentially just deliver the same size box to every house. I don't know. I'm sure they're not going to want to stick around and chat when they do get here. No, I did ask one. When we did get one on iPhone release day, and I'm like, so how many of these size boxes have you delivered today? And he just laughed at me. I'd imagine just just one or two. Yes, their truck is just jam-packed with iPhone 11, 11 Pro, and 11, I forgot what the other one is, the Big Pro. Yep, the iPhone Bigger. Yes, which you will have to tell me how you like yours, and then I will have to decide if I'm going to buy one. But I'll probably wait till I can just go to the store and... Grab one. For the Pro, you mean? I didn't do the big one. I just, yeah. I won't mess with the other one. I'll get the Pro. It's a new toy. It's going to come out of the box and I'm going to go squee and it's going to be great. I like the 11. We're going to turn this into an iPhone episode. I wish the 11 had the telephoto lens. Like, I don't like the fact that it has the wide and the ultra wide angle lens. To me, I'd rather have like ultra wide and telephoto or wide and telephoto. So, I'll get the Pro primarily because it has the telephoto. You don't want the telephoto lens because the telephoto lens on iPhones is garbage compared to like SLR telephotos, uh, especially when we talk about like the aperture and what it's capable of capturing. You are better off. It's more of a pain, but you're better off capturing on the regular wide and zooming in. Interesting. I know that sounds like a stupid, dumb thing, but like the telephotos don't have the same image stabilization, a bunch of other stuff. So it's 100% a valid trade off, in my opinion, to say just go with the wide and zoom in because that was always your best bet anyway. Even on like the regular pro, not the pros, but like the big phones that are out there today with the telephotos. Yep. Telephoto lens is garbage. All right. So, you know, I'm going to have to go play with that on mine because I still have the 10. So I have the telephoto and the regular. And I'm telling you, the telephoto on yours is garbage because I have the same phone. Yeah. But now, can you still do one thing, my, and, I'll say my wife loves it more than I do is the portrait mode. So you're going to lose the portrait mode then on the 11 because that leveraged the telephoto, right? No. So on the 10R, the XR, whatever the heck it is, yep. because that didn't have two lenses, that has portrait mode, but they do it all in software. Got it. Now that you do have the two lenses, you can actually pick up the extra depth information. So it does have portrait mode. I don't know if it does the portrait mode for pets versus the portrait mode for people, or like if like whatever the heck that stuff is, but it absolutely does do portrait mode with depth information from both lenses. Interesting. I'll still go by the Pro. But it was interesting. So I also do the moment lens stuff. And I was curious what moment was going to do with the whole square camera mount because it kind of messes up where do you run the plastic to be able to attach lenses to your phone? Yeah, I'm going to have to wait and see what they do there. Well, so they already announced their case. For the Pro, they use the lens for the wide angle and for the telephoto. And they just put a little hole there for the ultra wide because they said the ultra wide is so... It's just such a different lens that to put a lens on the ultra wide angle just is a whole mess of stuff. Yeah, I'd imagine you're going to end up with all sorts of weird just kind of bending and tearing and what are you going to do? Wide the wide? Right. So they just don't even support using their lenses on the ultra wide. It's just for the telephoto and the wide angle. So any lenses, all of that you can still use because they had enough room with that square mount to fit plastic around there to be able to attach all the lenses and all of that. So, good news is, if I do go to the Pro, I can still use all that stuff. I just have to buy a new case. That was always the thing. That's right. the nice thing about Moment is, yeah, you got to do the case, but the lens is the lens. So, usually, you've been pretty good with those for... Right, and let's face it, you're going to buy a brand new case anyways, because... Oh, already have. Yes. Because, what is it? Fragile. Yeah, well... You saw the video though, didn't you see the phone like bounce off the ground and go flying across in their keynote video off the rubber mat? 
<laughs> I saw the video where they shot like marshmallows at it. Can handle marshmallows. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so with all of that and talking about protecting your iPhone. Oh, look at that segue. Should we talk about... <laughs> you, pro- <laughs> now you've made it. Should we dive into some listener questions about protection stuff in Office 365? Yeah, let's do it. As IT professionals in the cloud era, sometimes it feels like we don't speak the same language as the rest of the organization. So when stakeholders from finance or other departments start asking about a specific project or team's Azure costs, they don't always realize how much work is involved in obtaining that information. Sifting through cluttered CSVs and a complex mass of metadata in order to manually create custom views and reports. It's a real headache. On top of helping you understand and reduce your organization's overall Azure spend, ShareGate Overcast lets you group resources into meaningful cost hubs and map them to real-world business scenarios. This way, you can track costs in the way that makes most sense with your corporate structure, whether it's by product, business unit, team, or otherwise. It's a flexible, intuitive, and business-friendly way of tracking Azure infrastructure costs, and it's only available in ShareGate Overcast. Find out more on sharegate.com slash IT pro. So we had a couple questions, one from Darren and one from Patrick, and these have kind of trickled in over a while. I can't remember whose was first. I think Darren asked his a while back and we just got one from Patrick and we're like, okay, maybe we should actually finally start talking about this. But their questions were all around... ATA, ATP, AIP, RMS, IRM, I think I got them all. AIP, I mentioned that one. Yes. All around those slew of three-letter acronyms in Office 365. So we're going to try to dive into them at a high level. To be fair, oh, Labels was in there too. I was bummed out. Labels doesn't have a three-letter acronym to go with all the other ones. Although it kind of ties into some of the other acronyms. But kind of go over a high level of what some of the differences are where some of these actually overlap. And probably over the next few weeks, we'll dive into some details around each of these because it's a big topic to talk about all of these. So we'll yeah, give you guys an overview and then kind of dive into some of them in more detail in some future episodes over the next couple of weeks, month or so. Acronym soup. Let's break out the crackers and see what we can do. Yes. Which acronym would you like to start with? Or do you want to start with labels, the non-acronym? Oh, well, I think it helps to kind of start with some of this stuff. You have to approach it based on the tiers and, and where they fall out. ATP, ATA. Uh, why don't we start with RMS? RMS, the Rights Management Service. Azure Rights Management Service. Well, hold on. Rights Management, not to be confused with Azure Rights Management, not to be confused with Information Rights Management. <laughs> but all kind of tied together. Yeah, some of them are kind of the same. Like, yeah. So since you picked it, do you want to start with it or do I get to start with it? <laughs> what is Rights Management Service? Oh, Rights Management Service. So Rights Management Service, specifically Azure Rights Management Service, is a component of Azure, which is integrated with things like Office 365 or Azure Information Protection. So Azure RMS or ARMS uses data from services like Information Protection or AIP because AIP has your data. You got to get it over here and figure it out what this is. So RMS makes data and documents unreadable or unavailable. Well, I guess unreadable because they'd be available. They just wouldn't be able to open them to people that aren't authorized to. So you either authorize, well, entities that aren't authorized to. So you either authorize users or services through RMS. So RMS puts locks on files and then based on your role, like do I have a role assignment or a write that allows me to read, print, you know, things like that, then you can go ahead and potentially interact with that document. Right. So this is essentially, everybody's familiar with DRM for media because Everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but I remember the day when you would want to try to get music and movies for free and then DRM became a big deal to try to protect those digital rights so you couldn't copy them, you couldn't 
rip them from DVDs, all of that. You couldn't go download them from your friends. Because remember like iTunes, you used to have to actually sign in. And I think some music, you still have to do this. You had to sign in and it would say, yes, you're authorized to play this music. RMS is the same thing. And this RMS actually came from an on-premises service. So rights management service or RMS has been around for a while. I can't remember which server version it started with. This is where it starts to get really confusing. So on-premises, what was RMS or ADRMS, Active Directory Rights Management Services? Now in the cloud, we call that AIP or Azure Information Protection, but but then AIP integrates with ARMS or Azure Rights Management Service. <laughs> it's like super duper fun. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, and if you go start Googling this, you will have some articles, and this is probably a good one, is comparing Azure Information Protection and AD Rights Management Service and what they do, because some of this too has just been a little bit of a it's almost been a little bit of a rename because this article essentially says, hey, if you've done AD rights management service, how does Azure Information Protection compare to this? Which, and this is, I was looking for information about this the other day because my understanding is is that AIP is RMS. To a certain extent, well, well, maybe there's a few things well, but the desktop client is still Azure Information Protection, is that they've kind of smashed Azure Information Protection, Information Rights Management, and RMS all into a single service now. Because I don't think those are separate services you can go license and purchase and own. Oh yeah, they are. Are they? Yeah, because when you're in Office 365 and you turn on IRM, you are given a limited use license to Azure RMS. RMS. Yeah, so you can go buy Azure RMS totally separately, even though RMS is a tool in the toolbox or part of that bundle that is AIP. So they've done a bang-up job there. But if you have RMS, you get AIP. So RMS is almost more like an upgrade to AIP rather than separate services. It starts to get confusing. So it's your path in. So if you're coming from Office 365, really we don't talk too much about AIP if all we're trying to do is just information rights management because you're just going to turn on ARMS and you're going to have that limited use license and life's good. You're ready to go. Should you want to upgrade and get into some of the other things that AIP give you, then it starts to get interesting because now you've mixed AIP, ATP, and ARMS kind of all together into this thing. It's super not confusing at all. I believe there's two licenses of AIP too. Everyone is always looking to save time in their day, just like moving to the cloud can save you from the mundane tasks of patching, updating, and maintaining servers. SaneBox can save you from the mundane and time-consuming task of managing your email. SaneBox works with your existing email configuration to make your mailbox awesome. It may be using Sane Black Hole to avoid mailing and cold sales emails or Sane Reminders to automatically remind you when you need to follow up on an email. You can even snooze an email, yeah, just like that pesky alarm clock in the morning, to defer or to de-emphasize an email that doesn't need your immediate attention. So what are you waiting for? There's nothing to install, nothing to learn. Just go to sanebox.com slash all things. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash all things to get two weeks free and a $25 credit. This is one, again, we're going to try not to dive into too many details and get in the weeds too much here. Because we're going to have to go back and do an episode just on licensing and features with AIP. Because I think there's an AIP like standard and an AIP professional, or think like an E3 and an E5 of AIP, if I'm remembering right from what I looked at when it came to licensing this. But it really is. It's what you said. You can apply this at the SharePoint level. You can go in and apply this to documents. And under the covers, it's just an encryption of the file. And then Like you said, granting certain rights, whether users are allowed to copy, paste, I lost my screen here that had all the options on there, if they can print it, if they can forward it. There's even settings on how frequently 
think the document, but you essentially have to authorize to the server to see if you're still allowed to open the document. So if you want to email a document to somebody and say 30 days later they're no longer going to be allowed to open this, to access it, to view it, you can use the whole RMS AIP to put those constraints around the documents to protect that content, to allow it from escaping too far from within the borders of your Office 365 environment. Well, but not just Office 365, right? Because you could just get the service and apply it. (laughs) You can do it other places. That's true. It's kind of easiest to talk about it in the context of Office 365 because then we have all these other security mechanisms in place. So it's additive to what potentially is already there based on O365 or your Azure AD licensing, where you might have rights to something like conditional access policies and getting a little bit more advanced. So it's all about protecting the full life cycle and saying, hey, you know, I could certainly have a conditional access policy and apply that policy like a client policy inside of conditional access that says, any SharePoint library that you get to, nobody can download anything. Like guests can never download. Right. And, and that word, they can't print, they can't download in OA. And so, like, Office Online respects that. The SharePoint web renders respect all that stuff. You're all good. This is to carry that information when it lives outside of, like, in Office 365 land, when it lives outside of SharePoint or it lives outside of Outlook. What happens if somebody who does have rights to that document goes ahead and downloads it and puts it on a USB drive and then hands that USB drive to their friend? Well, you want that encryption mechanism. And and the authorization to open that to potentially follow further just outside of that web world that it might have lived in. And that was something I was going to mention. RMS travels with a document or it travels with the file, whether it's a document or some other file. RMS is at the document level, not at the storage location level. Because you can go in and apply this rights management service too to work with works on mobile devices, like we said, it works with Office 365, but you can also apply it to Windows Server file services, to on-premises exchange servers, to Windows Active Directory. So you can have files stored in any of those places and they just call back to this, the document essentially calls back to this rights management service to make sure you can do what you're trying to do. Yeah, the other place that it lives outside of kind of file stores like SharePoint and file servers is also potentially Exchange through integration with Exchange transport rules. Got it. So then you can apply them. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that one yet because then you apply it to an email right? As it goes through your exchange server? Yeah. So if you think about having maybe like classification labels on your emails. Are you going to bring us to labels now? No, I said a classification label. So based on that classification label, then you bring in your specific template that you want to apply based on that. Yes. So usually it's at the document store, like you said, like a a age. Now, when I say document store, we're not talking about all of SharePoint Online. We're talking about specific lists and libraries. It's not everything. You configure this library by library. Or in the case of file shares, same thing, kind of having that out there. It's a one by one kind of methodology to get there. So same thing with Exchange. It's a classification label by classification label thing that comes through. Yeah, because in SharePoint, well, you can do it in Word because if you're going to put rights management service on a document, you can just go into Word. And this is if you don't have SharePoint, Office 365 Exchange. If you're just doing rights management, you go into Word, set the rights management settings right within your Office application and apply it there. And then you do have the information rights management option in a SharePoint document library where you can restrict permissions from the library on download. So if someone downloads a file from this library, apply these certain information rights management settings leveraging RMS and also do things like block users from uploading any documents to a library that doesn't support IRM. And this is where some of that IRM and RMS and all of that gets confusing because in SharePoint it's all IRM using RMS. RMS is the encryption mechanism, if I'm kind of 
distilling array. So RMS is the encryption mechanism where in the case of SharePoint, like IRM, it's a setting that's applied to the place where we store the document with the encryption. Uh, so it's just all sorts of fun. Yeah. You know, the other thing is we're talking about just like, you know, SharePoint and email and, and things like that. So primarily office files, right? That That is kind of the first use case. There's also protection with things like PDFs through Adobe's clients, or if you are writing your own custom documents or you're writing even your own custom file viewers, things like that. There's also SDKs that you can go ahead and interact with to bring that same kind of encryption mechanism to bear outside of Office 365 or outside of Office documents and PDFs. Yeah, which is a good point because up until relatively recently, Adobe Acrobat did not support RMS encrypted PDFs. You actually had to go use like Foxit PDF to have the full support for rights management. And I think it was within the last year that Adobe started supporting it natively in their products. In the documentation, the things that do support rights management service or RMS, they're called RMS enlightened applications. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes too. That was some marketing got their hands on that one. Yeah, to the table of RMS enlightened, enabled would have been such a better word, I think, applications that are out there. And then I'll also include this stuff for PDF readers. But when you read about PDF readers, you're not reading about PDF readers that support RMS. You're reading about PDF readers that support Microsoft information protection. Not even Azure Information Protection, but Microsoft Information Protection. So MIP instead of AIP. Because AIP is simply one of Microsoft's information protection solutions. Whew. You didn't think I was going to go to MIP, did you? I did not think you were going to go to MIP. We could talk about MAIP, Microsoft <laughs> Azure Information Protection. Maybe that's what it should be, MA. <laughs> No, that's essentially the same thing. That is the same thing. So, so th this is when you go so far down this rabbit hole. This is this is what I'm saying. There's Microsoft Information Protection Solutions, of which Azure Information Protection is one. So they've got like AIP, you know, bundles with ARMS, but then there's this also super set of things that sits above it, which is more part not maybe a licensing bundle, but it's the the functional family or the application family where all this stuff lives under. And you wonder why there were questions about this and why we have avoided this topic. <laughs> intentionally <laughs> until we can no longer do it. Obstility is disrupting cloud training as we know it with their on-demand platform, Skill Me Up. Their new design focuses on a user flow to better support role-based learning paths with these great new features. Real-time, hands-on labs are now included with each subscription to build your skills competence. Hundreds of cloud courses with more added daily to transform your skills for today's cloud-first careers. Role-based learning paths guide you through associated level courses in an easy-to-view layout and tracker. Microsoft Azure and Microsoft 365 certification prep courses and labs to support you leading up to exam day. Learn more and start your free three-day trial at www.skillmeup.com. If you want me to take it a step further, you have all the Office 365 stuff and the licensing. You also have RMS for individuals. Yes. Yeah, so if your organization already uses it, it's like you go to this website for individuals and go see if your organization uses it. I think from when I tried this before, because I already have it for my email address, so I can't do it. I think there is a free level or you can do like a trial of this for individuals. So it is free. It is free. So if your subscription isn't found in Office 365, you can do it for free. Let's see. So for individuals, it is free, 100% self-service. So say somebody sends you a document that is protected by RMS and you open it in one of these clients that supports RMS. So it goes down the path of saying, oh, this thing is RMS encrypted. Let me prompt you and, and say, hey, Ben, you need to sign into this. You know, And you're, and you're Ben at hotmail.com, whatever it is. And you go, huh, okay, well, let, let me sign in with my MSA or, or my Microsoft account. And because you can't be authenticated by Azure Active Directory, because your account 
doesn't live in Azure AD. It actually lives in, in another IDP, like the old Microsoft account system or MS Online. Then what it has to do is create you as a guest account. And then once you're a guest account, now you're all good in that other directory. You can authenticate as Azure AD and then go ahead and come through. So you have to go through that self-service sign up. And then once you're through self-service sign up and you're kind of federated through into that other directory, admins can come in, they can take control of your accounts within their directory, things like that, just to make sure everything's aligned and where it needs to be. So it's part of that flow of saying, hey, let's make sure that every single person that we intend to see this, those are actually the only entities that can see it, whether it was a person, a group, a a service account, a principal, things like that. Yes. That's a little heavy handed. I think most of the time, you know, you might think about like going out to externals or those outside your organization where all of a sudden now you really don't want to worry about self service sign up and licensing and all those other things. Maybe that's where you use OME or uh, message encryption to go ahead and have that stuff go out that way. But now message encryption just means once the message is unencrypted, then they can read everything in it. Now you, you still don't have those controls about printing and, and things like that. Trade-offs. Yes. There be monsters here. I have decided we don't do well with overviews. We just dive right <laughs> into the mud. <laughs> well, this isn't the mud. We're still at the top. We haven't even talked about the bottom yet. <laughs> that probably beats the AIP Azure RMS horse as much as we want to go into today. Well, we haven't even talked about what AIP is yet. <laughs> Like we we started off with started off with RMS and <laughs> we started off with a component of AIP and then we walked all the way up to MIP and then we never came back down and then we never came back down to Azure AIP. Well, it's not Azure AIP; it's AIP because it's yes, it's Azure IP or Azure AIP. So going back down to Azure AIP, oh, you're going to go up to AIP or up to AIP. Directionality is important here. Because we're going to be walking this hierarchical tree of stuff. We're going to be just be going up and down. And left and right. Sometimes diagonally. Both ways. In the summer. Uphill. Both ways in the snow. Just like when you were a kid walking to school. All over the place. Yes. So we started with RMS. We're going to go up to AIP. And then are we going to go back down? Well, we're not going to do all of this today. Because then we can go back down from there to data classifications. Well, AIP is going to get us into labels. And then it's right. all going to go off the rails from there. Which is where you get into your classifications and labels and yeah, all of that. Because that is essentially what Azure Information Protection is, is going from the rights management where you're doing that document level encryption. If you go up the tree to Azure Information Protection, this is a little bit higher level service that does, it covers labels, it covers... RMS, it's all about protecting your data and your information, thus Azure Information Protection, as it lives in various places. Because this doesn't even have to be strictly tied to Office 365. Based on... (laughs) No, it does not. (laughs) My understanding, because label... Well, that's diving back into labels. So... That is, I don't even know how to start with an overview of Azure Information Protection because it's kind of all those other... Yeah, time to play with the Legos. Yeah, exactly. Time to play with the Legos. That's what my two-year-old just said. Time to play with something. Was it Legos? (laughs) Did you catch it better than I did? (laughs) I'm assuming Legos. It's either that or it's tea time. So maybe what we do since we started with RMS in this one is we can start with AIP in the next one until it gets back down to RMS and then see if we can go sideways into the next thing from there. Because we've still got... Into labels? (laughs) Or ATA or ATP? (laughs) Labels or ATA or ATP. Yes, because we're going to have to zigzag our way around this one. Yeah, although ATP and ATA kind of start inching their way out of this a little bit, sort of, ish. So yes, yeah, so that sounds like a good idea. We'll start with AIP and labels next week and go from there. And hopefully, hopefully Darren and Patrick and anybody else that's listening, we didn't confuse you more. Hopefully that helped distill it down a little bit as to where you go with all of this. And we'll have a bunch of links in the show notes for anybody that is interested in reading more. And yes, we are sorry, it just does get confusing 
no matter how simply you try to explain it. I have never heard a simple explanation of all of this. I don't think one exists. Someone should write a book. Someone should. How about we write one, Scott? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> you know my opinions on books, and I think, I've intro- I think I've introduced you to your own opinions on book writing now. So, <laughs> I have not received feedback for my draft yet. Well, someday. Someday I will receive my feedback, and then I will probably bang my head even harder into a wall. Yes. All right. Sounds good. But with that, let's go get back to work, and we will mentally prepare ourselves for AIP and labels on the next episode of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.